Hey guys, it's Liana and I'm here today to talk about By Force Alone by Lobby Tadar. So this is a book that I read with Buddy Read with Amanda from the Night Librarian for our monthly Buddy Read. Um, as of the filming of this video, we have not yet had our live show, but as of the filming of this video, she has started the book and has informed me that she is not liking it. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Um, so you watching this right now may or may not know more than me because I haven't decided if I'm posting this before or after the live show, probably after. So you know more than me. <laughs> But yeah, so if you don't know anything about this book and you didn't watch our live show, which has happened in the past for you, this is a, a retelling, reimagining, recontextualization of the Arthurian legend. And this book is weird as fuck, but I dug it. I was I was like on the fence, but I was like, do I love this or do I hate this? I think I love it. It's a weird one and I feel like you will either love it or hate it. I don't see how you could feel in the middle about it because it's odd it's very odd so the best way that i can think to describe this is if joe abercrombie was to write a myth but he had just watched stranger things and was really inspired by stranger things so if that sounds weird to you it is but also if you've read this or if you're about to read it i think you'll find that that's accurate <laughs> because it is very grimdark in the it very much in the style of abercrombie where the people are kind of like disgusting humans doing disgustingly human things where they're ruthless and selfish and ambitious and there are many dicks being whipped out like throughout the book at all times like that was a little much on that to the point where it's like I don't really object to that at all like I don't really care like if you're gonna be describing genitalia but it just got to the point where I was just like again? Did we need to whip our dick out again? Again? Like, again, if you read Abercrombie books, he frequently makes mention of or references or his characters reference uh, men's fruits, which are balls, which I just love that as a euphemism. This book uh, has, if if Abercrombie has fruits, Lavi Tadar has swords, I guess, because that metaphor is used a lot to describe a penis. <laughs> like it is referred to as the sword or like describing what one is doing with it is described as like activities that are associated with a sword but it's understood by the reader and by the characters that we're not talking about a sword. So I could have done with less of that. <laughs> but otherwise uh, it had this older mythic quality which is not that's why I said if Abercrombie decided to tell a myth because the way Abercrombie writes it's not mythical it doesn't have this like old folklore legend quality to it and this book definitely does but it's like your folklore has been crashed by Abercrombie characters who are all whipping their dicks out <laughs> but I mean the women in it the men in it they're all kind of like disgusting in a very Abercrombie-esque way but it's still very much like the birth of a legend and it feels that way Merlin feels like Merlin like a magical thing but also definitely a gross and human and selfish and ambitious thing. The women in it too they could come out of, they could be in an Abercrombie book and you wouldn't blink an eye but they also feel like Nimue and Morgana <laughs> and like they feel like mythical legendary ancient figures but also so disgustingly realistically human and I think that is I, I believe that's kind of the intention here is to de- heroicize Arthur and everyone surrounding Arthur. But at the same time, it's it's doing things, making you question your own perception of your own, perhaps you know, your, your nation's history, your personal history, the way that we heroicize and mysticize and aggrandize our past, our collective past. And I mean, there's reference made to that too, constantly Merlin, because he is a, a magical figure that is kind of timeless, then he, thinks about that, about how things will be remembered, who will be remembered, how it will be recontextualized by their descendants, like he's actively thinking about it. So it's present in the narrative unambiguously, that discussion of what we just witnessed was not heroic or worthy of legend, but the fact that it's either intentionally being crafted by people like Merlin in order to result in legends being told, or just Merlin thinking about it like, well, I saw what went down, but I wonder what people will say about it in years to come. So I appreciated that from a meta narrative standpoint, what it's doing, which is it's something I've seen before. People, especially nowadays, do like to do that with the stories we think we know. So taking a character like Arthur and de heroicizing him, like, yes, we've. That's not entirely an original idea, but I think it's done more here than I've seen anywhere else. Uh, this was sort of sold and marketed as being similar to like Guy Ritchie's King Arthur. So that's what I expected. It is much darker and much 
it's doing just much more social commentary than that movie purports to even. So if you're going into it expecting that movie but in book form you won't like it. Or I mean you may like it but it's not that and I don't I think you'll agree that it's not that. It's only that in the sense of like it's a much more gritty and violent version of Arthur and you've got that sort of like it feels more like gangs, it feels more like the godfather, it feels more like that than like chivalry and knights and heroicism. So in that sense, uh, Guy Ritchie's is more like, you know, a street thug version. So in that sense, it's kind of there, but like, oh, other than that, it, the vibe is really different. And then yeah, the Stranger Things part, um, I can't really tell you why it's like Stranger Things because it's really spoilery, but it's like the Stranger Things. <laughs> because throughout the book, it's teased, I mean, because a big part of the Arthur legend is also the grail and the search for the holy grail. So that's brought into it, but there's constantly this question throughout the book and not just to do with the grail, it's to do with everything to do with Merlin and with Nimue and with Morgana, this clashing of science versus the mystical. And it's not entirely clear from this book if it's saying that, you know, everything that we thought of as magic is actually science that is not yet understood, because I've seen that done before. It's not that, it's magic. It's for sure magic. It's kind of this notion that they cannot coexist. The one, they are mutually exclusive. So as soon as you start bringing in science, it, it defeats the magic by necessity because magic inherently does not make sense. And when you're starting to make sense of the world, that is the like antithesis of magic. They cannot exist at the same time. And so I feel like, again, that's a narrative I've seen before where like, you know, slowly like these ancient lands lose their magic. The magic is leaving the world. And that's kind of what's going on here, but in a much more visceral and much more, I, it, it's, it's more obviously going on that they are literally clashing, that you cannot have science, math, technology present with magic. They, they can't, <laughs> you just can't. And so that's brought into it quite a bit, which again, I enjoyed. Uh, that was an interesting take on it. Cause again, it was, they are so much more overtly than I've seen before. I've seen before where it's just like, oh, you know, slowly magic is fading. Or again, I've seen the um, the other version of it where like people called this magic once upon a time, but really uh, today is in science. We understand that this was a science thing. It's not doing really either of those things. It's really just saying you had but loads of magic, but as soon as you brought technology into it, just magic just couldn't deal. <laughs> <laughs> could not deal. So I found that interesting and then again I can't tell you why it's like Stranger Things but it's absolutely like Stranger Things. Which that part of it I love Stranger Things like I really really love Stranger Things and so as I was experiencing that part of it I was just like I was not expecting this. <laughs> I kind of love it but also I do I hate it like is this a good idea? I don't know if this is a good idea but I'm here for it. Like as I like the back of my mind while I was experiencing this book I was just like what was that other thinking? And did his editor not ever go, are you sure about this, bro? Are you sure you want to do that? It's it's very out there. But it's kind of like unapologetically bonkers, which I'm here for. And the author wasn't shy about it. The author wasn't just like, they've been doing something weird. The author was like, I'm doing this weird ass fucking thing and I'm doing it. <laughs> You're like, you're doing it. All right, we're doing it. Oh, so yeah, I enjoyed that. And then the telling of it, there was this, the book is called By Force Alone. And I've seen before, and more often than not, like 60-40, I tend to be more annoyed than not annoyed when I see the actual title of a book in the book. Unless it's like, there's a trick to doing that. I just feel like if it feels like the title was put in there because that was the title, I hate it. Versus if it feels like, well, this book was titled this because when it was written, this was said so often that you're like, well, let's call it that. If it feels like that, then you're like, or then me, for me, I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, this is appearing in here because that's just part of the story and that's why we called it that. So cart leading the horse, basically. If I feel like it's shoved in there because that's the title, then I like Rise of Skywalker. Well, that was shoved in there. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. So in this book, more so than I've seen in probably any other book, unless the name of the book is like a name of a character. Like obviously like in Harry Potter, like the name Harry Potter appears frequently. Like, so I'm not talking about that. By force alone, that phrase, I didn't count, but it's in it a lot, like a lot. It's like the thesis of the book. And it's because the book is told in this way that it's it's not a poem, but it kind of sometimes feels like one. It kind of sometimes feels like like this older form of storytelling, you know, like like the Odyssey or the Iliad or like Beowulf, where you're telling vignettes of a longer saga in this. And it's, it's not a poem and it's not written as a poem, but it has this vibe of a poem because it's kind of repetitive in this poetic way. And it keeps coming back to by force alone as though 
like if somebody told you that this was like an epic poem that's called by force alone you wouldn't blink an eye and that part of it i also kind of really super duper enjoyed i thought that was kind of brilliant the way it was doing that and i can't put a finger on it because again it is not a poem it's not told as a poem but it's got the vibe of a poem of a ballad of a saga of something like that and it keeps circling back again to by force alone and it's applied not just to arthur it's applied to everything it's basically the thesis of the book is that nothing is achievable but by force alone and it's used to describe and to to address every form of like taking something or doing something by the skin of your teeth or it, it's i i, I can't it's just everything. Basically everything boils down to by force alone. A woman giving birth by force alone. A man claiming a seat of power by force alone. Somebody making it through a long journey by force alone. It's the entire book. Uh, so it's aptly named and it didn't bother me. It didn't annoy me when I saw it because I wasn't just like by force alone. I was just like, it's kind of genius. Yeah, by force alone. Yeah, I feel you. I get you. I see you. I'm with you. That could annoy you. <laughs> I, I, under I appreciate that uh, while I enjoyed it, it, that could easily annoy you and I would un be understanding if it did. For me it worked. In general I just feel like this is the book which I'm holding upside down. This is a book that's either gonna work for you or it doesn't and I would not at all be frustrated or angry or or uh, I wouldn't really disagree with the person who said it didn't work for them at all. I'd be like I feel you. <laughs> like I was on the fence and I literally like it was a hair's breadth away from me hating it, but I actually quite loved it. Like I gave it four out of five stars. It's just very, it's deeply bizarre, but it's doing its thing and it is doing its thing by force alone. <laughs> it's just unapologetically doing the thing that it wanted to do. And I'm here for it. And I kind of want, I, I also, you know, you know, you don't know what you don't know, but I get the sense from the little bit that I do know about the Arthur legend. There's a lot more in here that I'm missing because I'm not that familiar with the Arthur legend, uh, the various iterations of it, all the mythos associated with it, I don't know that much about it. I watched The Sword in the Stone as a kid, <laughs> I've seen the guy Richie King Arthur, and uh, oh, I watched Camelot on stars. <laughs> so yeah, I don't really know much about Arthur. Like we studied a little bit in some of my anthro classes as like the cultural genesis of the Arthur legend and what that meant for for people and how they use that to define themselves as a people, which is why that part of this book really did. Uh, that part I could easily appreciate because I actually did. That's the part I do know about, not the actual events of the Arthur legend, but just more about what the Arthur legend did to create a narrative for a people. So when the book was very overtly addressing how Basically Merlin is like, the people need a legend to define themselves by and I'm giving them one. I was like, yeah, that's what happened in history. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so like that part I know. But I get the sense that the author did put a lot of things in here that I, I know why I'm missing. I know that I'm not getting references and, and twists on pieces of the Arthur legend that if I was more familiar, I would could more deeply appreciate. So perhaps if I was more familiar with the Arthur legend, Maybe I would hate it because I'd be like, oh my god, what'd you do to the other legend? Or I would appreciate it more. I think I would appreciate it more. And it might even bump it to five stars. But I'm just like, I don't know if it's brilliant because I don't know what it's playing off of. So I just get the sense that it's there and that I am not getting it. But the parts that I, the, because of the parts that I did get, I suspect there are parts that I did not. Anyway, let me know in the comments down below if you've read this book, if it sounds like a book that would be for you. Um, again, like I'm not recommending it un unabashedly wholeheartedly. I'm saying, I liked it and you very possibly could like it but it's a weird one <laughs> so like go into it ready for it to be weird <laughs> it's really it's really weird so yeah let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about the Arthur legend about Arthur as the mythos that defined a nation <laughs> sure tackle that in the comments <laughs> I don't know whatever you want to let me know I post videos on Saturdays and other times but definitely Saturdays <laughs> so like and subscribe and I'll see you when I see you.